Hey everyone, Current ECG here. My name's Dave Klein and I'll be your tour guide for the next uh, couple of minutes or so. And by the end of this episode, I hope to have you all literally depolarizing right out of your seat. Now today I want to speak about an important topic. The world has changed for us with this COVID-19 coronavirus situation. And so I thought it's important for Current ECG to put out an episode to give us some additional information as clinicians and emergency care providers that have a interesting ECG component built into them that might help us identify and even manage some of these patients. So I've entitled this episode, COVID-19 Could Break Your Heart. Let's start with a quick case. 54-year-old female patient, Paramedics do a 12 lead. They see an obvious anterior and even possible lateral wall changes. And so they think, let's activate the cath lab, which is correct. So they call the cath lab. The cath lab gets activated. Patient arrives. They go up. They perform the procedure. And what's happening? They realize, wow, this patient has clean coronary vessels. How can that be? They do some further diagnostics, and this turns out to be a positive COVID-19 patient. So what does that mean for us? Well, we're going to get back to that in a little bit. Next patient. Same scenario, 60-year-old male patient, here's the presenting ECG. Paramedics see an obvious anterior wall MI, they activate the cath lab, they're within that distance for cath lab activation. Upon arrival though this time, further assessment shows that the patient had a history of a fever and a cough. The cath lab decides, look, let's not take this patient up, we're worried about the patient being a positive COVID-19 scenario here. Let's not do the cath right now. Maybe these ECG changes might be indicative of what's going on with COVID-19. So they delay treatment troponins keep rising, a couple of days go by, they decide, you know what, it's safe enough now for us to take this patient up to cath, and what happens? Patient has a complete left anterior descending coronary artery occlusion, and they have a loss of myocardial tissue and an ejection fraction of about 30%. And that's because there was a delay to treatment here over the worry that potentially COVID-19 can cause these ECG changes. So what does COVID-19 do to the heart? Well, we know there's not a lot of research out about this, right? There is no randomized control trials that have been done. There is no validated studies. So a lot of the information we're getting is based on, you know, small cases and information between people passing it around between different countries on what's happening with COVID-19 and how can that virus affect the heart. If we look back in history... We know that there's tons of research on things like influenza A and influenza B, you know, really prominent viruses. And if you look through some of that data and that history, what we found is, is we know a lot of these viruses, of course, they cause pulmonary changes, they cause things like pneumonia, they cause things like shortness of breath, they affect the lungs. But a lot of the research shows that a lot of these patients end up dying later on of cardiac related issues and maybe we should start paying closer attention to what's happening with that patient's heart. And so we look right away at the patient as they come in and they're critical and like, hey, this is a pulmonary issue, pneumonia, it could be CHF, COVID-19, it's a virus, it's attacking the lungs, there's no doubt about it. Patient could be hypoxic, which can lead to a whole host of other signs and symptoms. But seven to ten days later, the patient seems to be recovering, but then bang, they have this real quick deterioration. And why is that happening? Because of this cardiac failure issue. The virus is in fact attacking the patient's heart. And we need to prepare for these types of scenarios so we can better identify and help treat these types of patients. Now, not all viruses are the same. Of course not. You know, viruses do different things in our body. But we know with some of the pre, you know, existing information on viruses in the past that we know that they do attack the heart not only the lungs and so we should be preparing ourselves and taking a closer look at these COVID-19 patients as potentially not only pulmonary problems but cardiac patients as well. And so why is that happening? Well, when you get a virus in your body, what happens is, is your body recognizes this virus is there. It doesn't like it. It doesn't want it there. And so it says, you know what? Let's, let's mobilize the troops. Let's attack it. Let's put up our defense mechanisms. And that whole process is really in a massive inflammatory response. The inflammation that's occurring in the body is a way for your body to try and fight off this foreign virus that's entered it like COVID-19. Now, in certain types of patients, we call these patients type 1 MI patients. What happens is if you have a history of coronary artery disease, well, you've already built up plaque within those coronary vessels. And although that plaque is stable right now, 
When the inflammation occurs and that massive inflammatory response is there, what happens is that plaque becomes very susceptible to becoming unstable, then it ruptures, and then a thrombus is produced, and guess what's happening? Now the patient's actually having an MI. They have an occlusion myocardial infarction, and you're going to see some changes on an ECG that are very similar to what you see in your normal MI patients, because guess what? They are having an MI as a result of this problem. So what about these type 2 MI patients, we call them? What is going on with them? Well, what I mean by that is, as a part of this whole massive inflammatory response, you have this big sympathetic nervous system surge, right? The body's fight or flight response kicks in. And what happens? That makes your heart pump faster. It makes your heart pump harder. And so the heart needs more sugar water oxygen to survive. The increased oxygen demand can't be met now. And so what does that cause? That causes ischemia, that causes cardiotoxicity, and that causes damage to the cardiomyocytes of your heart. And that's a result of the inflammation process caused by the virus now causing, hey, the diagnosis, it's not occlusion myocardial infarction, no. In this case, the type 2 patient, we say, is diagnosed with myocarditis. And what happens as a result of that myocarditis? Well, the patient's going to heart failure, they have STEMI changes on an ECG, and they suffer from shock if not recognized and treated earlier. And remember, these patients are usually ones that, hey, their pulmonary issues seem to be resolving. They seem like, hey, their lungs are looking better. They're breathing more easily. I think they're improving. And then, bang, six, seven, ten days later, they start to deteriorate rapidly. And that's because now the heart's being affected and the patients are being thrown into cardiac failure as a result of this virus. And in particular, what we're seeing is it's happening with COVID-19. So consider these patients not only pulmonary patients, but potentially cardiac ones as well. And also, as part of that massive inflammation response that occurs in this sort of type 2 MI patient, we say, is a big cytokine release. That's part of that whole process, and that causes systolic dysfunction. The heart can't pump and eject blood as efficiently to the periphery of the body. That causes damage to the inner lining of the vessels, so endothelial damage. It causes this apoptosis or programmed cell death to the myocardial cells of your heart. And the heart, because it's trying to work so hard in this massive sympathetic surge that's occurring, it causes hypertrophy. It causes the heart to become enlarged and not able to overcome peripheral vascular resistance. Here's an ECG and you see in these patients. Let's get to the ECG component. So what's happening here? Well, if you look at lead AVR, you can see that lead AVR has what appears to be like an elevated ST segment. And why is that? Well, lead AVR looks directly at the right ventricle. And so what's happening when patients who are suffering from things like myocarditis, I've spoken about endocarditis in the past, what happens is one of the cells that are most susceptible to that initial inflammatory problem is the right bundle branch cells. What starts to happen is conduction through the right bundle branch starts to slow significantly. And in fact, it slows so much that it looks like there's damage occurring to the right ventricle because the conduction is just not getting through. The depolarization of the right ventricular cells now has to come through the left ventricular cells because they're working and being provided circulation and depolarization normally because the left bundle branch is okay. But the right bundle branch is slowed and those cells are becoming activated in a much more delayed process. And that's causing it to look like injury to the right ventricle. And hey, lead AVR, it looks directly at the right ventricle. It thinks it's seeing an injury vector pointing straight at it. And so it gives you ST segment elevation. Also note here in lead 1 and AVF, the axis, normal axis is right shouldn't look like this this one has the right axis deviation that's occurring you have a down s wave in lead one and a positive r wave in avf and that's causing what looks like to be right axis deviation why is the axis deviating to the right same issue because the cells are so delayed through the right bundle branch the depolarization is delayed it's causing what appears to be a 
injured right ventricle, and the injury to the right ventricle means the right ventricle is contracting slower than the left ventricle, almost appearing as though it's contracting just after the left ventricle, which means when it finally does contract, it causes the axis to shift toward that force that's occurring, which is now in the right ventricle, and you get this right axis deviation. So remember that, the left ventricle contracts, and then the right ventricle is slow, and it contracts behind the left ventricle, so all of the force that the cardiac monitor is seeing in the end is seeing just right ventricular force. And so it's delaying and shifting that axis to the right. You're also going to see things like right bundle branch block patterns. And of course, if the signal is so delayed through the right bundle, it may appear to be completely blocked. And so it looks like a right bundle branch block. And so on an ECG, you're going to get a right bundle branch block pattern, this classic RSR pattern that you see here in lead V1. The right bundle branch isn't truly blocked, no, but it's delayed so much that it appears as though it is. And so on an ECG, watch out for changes like right bundle branch block patterns. So again, in patients with COVID-19 who might be suffering from something like myocarditis, you need to be looking for things like as potential clues, not definitive, but potential clues are things like ST segment elevations and lead AVR, because lead AVR is looking directly at the right ventricle, which looks like it's injured. You're looking for things like right axis deviation, and again, you're looking for right bundle branch block patterns. And again, this is all because of that delayed transmission of the signal through the right bundle branch because it is slowed because those cells are being affected first by that inflammatory process. Hope that makes sense, guys. There's some interesting ECG clues there that you might want to use just in your differential. But again, always taking into fact the history of presenting illness, the patient presentation. And so in these types of scenarios, you're going to be looking for risk factors. So one of the number one risk factors you will see in patients who are suffering from myocarditis are age. Age is a major risk factor. The more elderly you are, the more susceptible you are to this process and problem of inflammation. And again, what else doesn't help? Well, if you have comorbidities, in particular, hypertension. Patients who suffer from chronic hypertension are very susceptible to viral attacks on their heart, resulting in things like myocarditis. Patients who have high cholesterol or hyperlipidemia, they're at risk. Patients who have a history of coronary artery disease. And patients who are, for example, diabetics, who can't mount the immune response to help fight off the virus itself. That puts them at greater risk as well. So throw that into your differentials when we're assessing our patients to help you gauge your element of risk for this particular type of patient who may be COVID-19 positive. Treatment? Well, treatment's not going to necessarily change. Keep in mind, some patients who suffer from COVID-19 may in fact have a massive inflammatory response that causes plaque rupture, creating a thrombus, and in fact they are truly suffering from myocardial infarction. So treat these patients or consider treating these patients with your classic mainstay treatments. Of course, aspirin, if it's indicated and there's no contraindications. Aspirin is a life-saving medication in patients with acute coronary syndrome. And activate the cath lab. If you feel that this is an ECG that warrants cath lab activation, then cath lab may be totally appropriate because, again, these patients may be truly infarcting because of this unstable plaque that's now ruptured as a result of this massive viral inflammatory process. I want to give a big thank you to one of my ACP students, Brittany Gianette, for doing these incredible images. I've spoken with Dr. Amul Matu, who recently did a presentation on this, who's allowed me to provide this information as well, and is happy to do a part two of this episode with me, which I can't wait to do as soon as this, hopefully, pandemic starts to slow down a bit if we're doing the right thing. So stay tuned for episode part two with Dr. Amul Matu. Also joining us will be critical care paramedic Pat Rial, one of my teachers early in my paramedic career. Can't wait to have him on the episode. A true wealth of knowledge. He'll be a great, great addition to this part two episode with Dr. Amomatu, and stay tuned for that. Now, I normally end, end my episodes by saying, you know, don't panic. Remember, sugar water auction to survive, and I continue on with my tagline. But today, I'm going to change it up. I want to say a big thank you to all people who are out there helping to, first of all, fight the front lines of COVID-19. I want to thank you to all the paramedics out there, the nurses, the doctors, the frontline workers, the truck drivers, the people working 
in the grocery stores. Everybody out there who is risking their lives and safety to keep our lives as normal as they possibly can. I really think we all need to just say thank you when you can and appreciate what these true heroes are doing. And remember, wash your hands, be safe, be kind, and stay current. Hey everyone, thanks for being a part of today's episode. If you'd like to continue your learning, improve your skills, and provide a higher level of patient care, well, come be part of our community. If you're a student who wants to break through in emergency medicine, learn how to work the trucks in the streets, well, this is for you. If you're a seasoned veteran who's like, hey, I need to brush up on my skills, technology's moving forward, so should we, then this is for you. Come join this community at CurrentECG.com. Let's make emergency medicine education and ECG interpretation a little less scary and a little more fun. Again, subscribe to us at CurrentECG.com. Hope to see you soon. Stay current.